Hello, internet. My name is Ariel. I'm a food scientist and plant breeder by training, and welcome to the first episode of Reclaiming Chocolates and Confections, a series where I attempt to make artisanal versions of mass-produced candies. Now, I realize that this video idea is in no way a novel one. There are many YouTube channels that make similar videos, the most notable channel being Bon Appetit, in their video series called Gourmet Makes, where we watch the very talented Claire Saffitz attempt to make gourmet versions of beloved mass-manufactured snacks, not limited to confections, and she does so with varying degrees of success. Contrast that to my videos. My videos will be very technical. I wanna walk you through the science and the techniques needed to make each confection, and also provide you with the recipe that you should be able to reproduce at home. With that said, I will be referencing back to some episodes of Gourmet Makes, either to build off of the work that Claire has already done or to answer specific questions that were left unresolved. Okay, so yeah, enough with the prelude, let's just get started. The first candy bar that we're going to tackle is Three Musketeers, largely because I want to address that elusive nougat that we see in a lot of candy bars. You know, that, that nougat that has a fluffy, short, tender texture that seems to leave everyone confused. Look at the texture of the nougat I know, though. It's I like, know. what is that? Why do they call it nougat? It's so fluffy, I don't know, understand yeah, no, that. So before I explain how candy makers achieve this texture, I think it'd be helpful to have a better understanding of what nougat actually is. Nougat is an example of an aerated confection, and like all aerated confections, the goal is to incorporate gas into a sugar mixture and stabilize the mixture before the gas has a chance to escape. The general protocol for making nougat is as follows. You whip egg whites to soft or medium peaks, then gradually add a hot sugar mixture to the whipping egg whites, and continue beating until you've incorporated as much air as you can and the mixture begins to cool. While it's procedurally simple, there's actually a lot happening at the molecular level. When you whip egg whites, proteins in the egg whites uncoil or denature and form a thin film around each of the air bubbles that you've introduced through whipping. As you continue to whip the egg whites, the protein coatings link together, eventually creating a network of proteins that further reinforces the walls of the air bubbles. And at this point, you've created a liquid foam. So millions of tiny air bubbles are dispersed throughout the water that's present in the egg whites. This liquid foam, however, is relatively unstable. Eventually, the air bubbles will coalesce, form larger bubbles, and escape. So how can we stabilize this foam? We can stabilize the foam by slowly introducing a hot sugar mixture into the whipping egg whites. The hot sugar induces thermal coagulation of egg proteins, which stabilizes the foam, and the sugar prevents further changes in air bubble size and distribution. So before, you had many microscopic air bubbles dispersed through water. Now, you have many microscopic air bubbles dispersed through a sugar matrix, and you've created nougat. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. This is where things get interesting. Nougat can be found in either a grained form or an ungrained form, depending on the state of the sugar matrix. The sugar matrix in an ungrained nougat contains no sugar crystals. In other words, the sugar matrix is completely amorphous. And this type of nougat has a chewy texture. The sugar matrix of a grained nougat, on the other hand, contains numerous small sugar crystals. And it's the presence of these sugar crystals that leads to a short, tender textured nougat. So the nougat in a Three Musketeers bar is an example of a grained nougat. To make grained nougat, candy makers intentionally induce crystallization in the sugar matrix, and they do this by adding either fondant or confectioner sugar to the whipped nougat mixture in a process called seeding. So let me back up and define what a crystal is. A crystal is a solid substance in which atoms, molecules, or ions are arranged in an orderly repeating pattern extending in three spatial dimensions. If you look at confectioner sugar under a microscope, you realize that it's actually made up of a bunch of tiny sugar crystals, specifically sucrose crystals. When you add these crystals to a nougat mixture, they act as seed crystals, telling other sucrose molecules in the sugar matrix of the nougat how to organize or crystallize in a more orderly fashion. So crystal formation is not instantaneous. It takes the sugar matrix approximately 24 to 48 hours after you've added the seed crystals to finish crystallization. Okay, so now that you understand the science, let's move on to actually making an artisanal Three Musketeers bar. The nougat formulation that I'll be using is from this book, Chocolates and Confections by Peter P. Grueling, known to some as the Bible of Artisan Confectionery. The ingredient amounts are listed below in the description box. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is prepare our confectionery frame. This is the container that we're going to deposit our finished nougat in. Here, I have four aluminum bars measuring 12 inches in length, 0.5 inches in height, and 0.5 inches in width. 
I've arranged the bars to create a frame with internal dimensions of 11.5 inches by 11.5 inches, and I've taped the bars together to prevent them from shifting around when I spread the nougat into the frame. To prevent the nougat from sticking to the frame, I've applied a thin layer of oil to the interior walls and placed the frame on top of an oiled piece of parchment paper. The nougat in the Three Musketeers bar is a grained chocolate nougat. So before heating our sugar or whipping our egg whites, we need to prepare our nougat flavorings in our seed mixture. Start by melting the dark chocolate and the cocoa butter together over a water bath. The chocolate in this mixture will flavor the nougat, and the cocoa butter, along with the seed mixture, helps to shorten the texture of the nougat, making the candy less chewy. Once the two are completely melted, set the mixture aside, keeping it warm until we need it. We aren't going to add this mixture to the nougat until the very end after we finished whipping the nougat. Next, sift together the pulverized milk powder, cocoa powder, and confectioner sugar, and set this mixture aside. We're going to use this mixture later down the road to seed the nougat. Combine the egg whites and the 25 grams of glucose syrup, I'm using corn syrup, in the bowl of a stand mixer fitted with a whisk attachment, and set this mixture aside. We aren't going to start whipping the egg whites until we've heated our sugar mixture to 112 degrees Celsius, 234 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, now that we have the flavor mixture, seed mixture, and egg white mixture prepared, we can move on to making the sugar mixture. To make the sugar mixture, combine 540 grams of glucose syrup, the sugar and the water in a pot, and heat the mixture to a temperature of 112 degrees Celsius, 234 degrees Fahrenheit, over medium-high heat. As the syrup comes to a boil, stir the mixture to ensure that the sugar crystals dissolve quickly and completely. Any undissolved sugar crystals will act as seeds that promote crystallization of the solution, which is something that we don't want. When the solution begins to boil, stop stirring. Any form of agitation at this point can cause the mixture to crystallize. And if you see any sugar residue on the sides of the pot, use a wet pastry brush to dissolve them away. Repeat this as often as necessary to keep the sides of the pot clean. Once the sugar mixture reaches 112 degrees Celsius, 234 degrees Fahrenheit, start whipping the egg white mixture on medium-high speed and continue cooking the sugar mixture to 118 degrees Celsius, 245 degrees Fahrenheit. If the egg whites reach soft peaks before the sugar mixture reaches 118 degrees Celsius, stop whisking until the sugar reaches the target temperature. Once the sugar mixture reaches 118 degrees Celsius, 245 degrees Fahrenheit, remove the mixture from the heat and stream the hot syrup into the whipping egg whites, using the side of the bowl as a guide. Avoid pouring the syrup on the moving whisk, since that's just going to fling the syrup onto the sides of the bowl and not actually into your whipping egg white mixture. This can be hard to do depending on the size and shape of your whisk, but just try your best. The hot sugar mixture should be added to the whipping egg whites as quickly as the whites will accept the syrup without collapsing, but do not dump the syrup all in at once. This will deflate the whites, resulting in a dense, low-volume nougat. Continue to aerate the mixture by whipping it until it has cooled to 50 degrees Celsius, 122 Fahrenheit, or until the machine has slowed significantly, approximately 10 to 15 minutes. Add the vanilla extract and whisk to incorporate. Using a silicone spatula, mix in the reserved melted chocolate mixture by hand, then mix in the sifted dry ingredients by hand. You want to incorporate these two components while the nougat is still warm and supple, so work as quickly as possible. You'll notice that it becomes increasingly difficult to incorporate these two components as the mixture cools, but do not panic. Just try to be as thorough as possible, cleaning off the sides of the bowl as best you can, and also making sure you scrape underneath the mixture. Chances are that there's still some unincorporated nougat at the bottom of the bowl. Now spread the nougat into the prepared frame, place a second piece of oiled parchment paper on top, and using a rolling pin, level the top of the nougat. Allow the nougat to cool to room temperature. Okay, now that we've made the nougat, we can move on to tempering the chocolate. And if you already know how to temper chocolate and the science behind it, feel free to skip ahead. When you temper chocolate, what you're actually trying to do is control how the fat in the chocolate crystallizes. In other words, you're trying to control how the cocoa butter in the chocolate crystallizes or solidifies. The fat molecules that make up cocoa butter can organize themselves into six different crystalline forms. Each form has a unique melting point, and each form has unique eating characteristics. The primary purpose of tempering is to make sure that the fat molecules in the chocolate crystallize primarily in form 5. This crystalline form is the most stable form that we can obtain from melted cocoa butter, and it leads to a chocolate that's glossy, snappy, shelf-stable at room temperature, and melts in your mouth and not in your hands. Okay, so how do we guarantee 
that the fat in our melted chocolate sets up in the form 5 configuration and not the other unstable crystalline forms. We use seed crystals. Specifically, we use form 5 seed crystals, and this is the same concept we used when making the grained nougat, with two main differences. The first difference, when making the grained nougat, we're trying to control the crystallization of sugar. Now when dealing with chocolate, we're trying to control the crystallization of fat. The second difference is, rather than introducing a foreign source of crystals like we did when graining our nougat, we're actually going to form these seed crystals in the melted chocolate itself by following this temperature curve. This is one method of tempering chocolate. It's the most widely used method by manufacturers, and it's the one I'll be demonstrating in this video. There are other tempering methods that use a foreign source of crystals to seed the chocolate, but we're not going to be talking about it in this video. Okay, so again, the take home message is that the function of tempering is to crystallize a small percentage of the cocoa butter in stable form five crystals, so that when the remainder of the liquid cocoa butter crystallizes or solidifies, it will crystallize in form five. And here's one method of doing that. First, heat the chocolate over a water bath to 50 degrees Celsius, 122 Fahrenheit to melt away all cocoa butter crystals. Now cool the chocolate to 27 degrees Celsius, 81 Fahrenheit, agitating the mixture to promote crystal formation. At this temperature, two types of crystals will be forming, form four and form five. The next thing we need to do is increase the chocolate's temperature to 32 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. This melts away the form four crystals, leaving only form five crystals, and 32 degrees Celsius, 90 Fahrenheit is the ideal working temperature for dark chocolate, so we want to keep our chocolate at this temperature when dipping the nougat centers. You can maintain the temperature of your chocolate using whatever method you'd like. I like to use my immersion circulator set at 32 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. We're first going to use this tempered chocolate to pre-coat the bottom side of the nougat slab with a thin layer of tempered chocolate. This process of pre-coating is also known as bottoming because the thin layer of chocolate will be the bottom layer of the confection. Pre-coated centers are easier to handle because the bottom coat of chocolate prevents the soft center, i.e. the nougat, from sticking to the dipping fork, and it also helps the center maintain its shape. To pre-coat the nougat slab, pour approximately four tablespoons of chocolate to cover the bottom of the nougat. Once this thin layer of chocolate begins to set, remove the nougat from the frame and cut the slab of nougat into pieces measuring 1.5 inches by 0.5 inches. This is possibly the hardest and the most boring part of confectionery work in my opinion if you don't own a guitar cutter, which I, like most people, unfortunately don't. So to make sure that my nougat pieces have nearly identical dimensions, I sketch out the portion size of each nougat on the top parchment paper, then use a clean sewing needle to perforate through the paper and the nougat and use these perforations as guides when cutting the slab of candy. Once you finish cutting your nougat, you can rope each piece in tempered chocolate using whatever method you'd like. I personally like to use what's called the turning method, where you first flip the nougat upside down so that the pre-coated bottom is facing upward, then gently press the nougat into the chocolate until the top of the nougat is level with the chocolate surface. Using a dipping fork, press down on one side of the nougat to make it roll 180 degrees in the chocolate, then lift the nougat center out of the chocolate and tap the nougat against the surface of the chocolate. This action pulls off excess chocolate, allowing you to form a thinner chocolate coating. Clean the bottom of the chocolate covered nougat against the edge of the container and gently transfer it onto parchment paper. This last part takes a bit of practice. <laughs> From time to time, clean the excess chocolate off the fork with a paper towel. A clean fork makes it easier for the center to slide off when you're transferring the dip center onto parchment paper. After you finish dipping all your nougat centers, leave them undisturbed for 24 hours. Well-tempered chocolate begins to set or crystallize very quickly, but it still takes several hours for all the fat molecules to finish crystallizing. Okay, so there you have it, a artisanal Three Musketeers bar. And I really want to demonstrate the texture of this grained nougat, so please enjoy the following footage. So there's a lot of information in this video. 
I hope it'll serve as a useful resource for food enthusiasts and anyone who's interested in making this at home. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something new. And if you did, like and subscribe. Anyway, if you have questions, feel free to send them my way. You can find me right here on these social media platforms. Okay, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Yeah, so the whole idea of making artisanal or gourmet versions of these mass manufactured candy bars is actually kind of an interesting and complex topic because the original versions of these candy bars were artisanal versions. Like in the 1800s, if you wanted candy, you just go to your local artisan confectioner to get your candy fix. Um, and then later on, these industrial producers came in, took these recipes, tweaked them a little bit to make them amendable for mass production. And because they had the economies of scale on their side, they were essentially able to obliterate the local artisan confectioner.